Liam, good to speak to you. Six months in the job. How do you reflect on those six months and particularly your first transfer window there and the start to the season? Yeah, it's been a uh, it's been a fairly full on six months. I think um, obviously the back end, the, the final bit of last season, getting over the line and the you know a different challenge of making sure we stayed in the division uh, to then obviously the summer where it being a extremely hectic one. Um, you know, I think we were seventeen players out, eleven new faces in, which obviously a huge amount of work goes on behind the scenes to you know to allow us to do that. So again, huge credit to a lot of the staff here. And then fortunately, we've we've, we've started quite well the season, so we're, it's about now obviously trying to continue that and understand where we're at, we've still got a lot of work to do, but you know, trying to build that momentum. How easy is it to integrate those uh, 11 new faces into the side? Very difficult. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now I think uh, you have people at different stages, right? So we had people obviously at the back end of last season that know us, the culture that we want, the expectations, the types of practices that we do. Um, and then to be fair, we did, we did a lot of work on the recruitment on characters and people. Uh, so people that we know that want to learn, that want to be coached, that want to improve, that want to buy into kind of the culture that we want here. So that kind of allows you to fast track little bits. Um, and then some of the bits off pitch, I think, you know, some of the lads are living in hotels for sort of six, eight weeks, which sounds terrific, but having done it myself, it's, it's not nice, it's not enjoyable. Things like, you know, your food, your downtime, your space, your, you know, them, them bits are challenging. So there's certain bits, a lot of the lads are now moving out and into apartments or houses or, you know, and, and are settled in the area. So things like that definitely, you know, for me, allow the players to actually perform to a higher level. Yeah, you touched on it there. You came in at what was a difficult time for the club last season. What goals have you set particularly for this season? It's funny that we uh, we did an exercise with the players early on around what you know what's the common goal for the team, um, and obviously everybody jumps to league positions at the end of the season. Which f for me, for us as a staff, we, we feel is too far away. I think um, for me, you know, it's, it's actually trying to chunk it up into shorter shorter things that are more manageable. So. We, we, we kind of work into, you know, practice being excellent every day is kind of our common goal that we're working towards. So, you know, I think that when you look at the volume of sessions, the volume of games, the intensity of the football league, as we all know, as it is, um, it's, it's, you know, can we turn up and be you know, the very best version of ourselves every day? Because ultimately, I think if you're able to do that in training uh, and repeat that to a high level, then, you know, I think it becomes habit for games. So that, that, that copying out on positions and all that, that's kind of the way we're working. You've had a pretty varied coaching career so far. Premier League, MK Dons, you've been in America, Belgium. How has all that shaped your philosophy and how you want your teams to play and, and in particular how you want this Oxford United side to play? Yeah, I think uh, obviously I started coaching extremely young. I was 21, I think, when I started coaching. So I do think when you transition, I think in terms of from playing to coaching and even in the early years of your coaching, I, th I think you do a lot of copying, a lot of stealing ideas um, because you, you've got nothing to fall back on so you don't have a philosophy so I think it took me quite a while to be quite confident in this is me in terms of how I want to coach and how I want to connect with people and players and then secondary to that I think is you know it's similar it takes a little while for you to kind of understand that how do I see the game how do I want it to look how do I want a team to perform how do I want to develop that team and players within it so I think the two are they, they kind of run parallel but not I'd say at the same time so it, so it took me quite a while and Again, I think the, the more open you are to learning and the, the different experiences, the different cultures, obviously going abroad that I was exposed to, different organisations at different levels, I think, you know, there are only, there are only things that if you, if you take the learning from it, that only can only, you know, further enhance kind of that, that playing and coaching methodology. And is there anyone in particular who has had the biggest influence in your career? Yeah, I've got a few. I've, uh, a few times I've been asked it, and to be fair, I'd probably say I'm quite fortunate in not saying it's gone out of the game completely, but you know that that kind of back in the day where you'd be sat around sort of a dining table and be some hugely experienced coaches, where it was extremely close academy and first team. You can you know listen to stories around people, and I, I do look back and I feel really fortunate. Brian Kluge Ipswich was one that you know from on the grass and developing players was outstanding and kind of my because I played in the academy there. I think some of the uh, the groundings that I got and some of the principles I still live by were, were very much formed there, and then. Uh, Terry Wesley at West Ham was one that, in terms of intensity, individual player development was was someone that, again, I look up to. And there's a few others, Steve Foley, uh, connecting with people, how you engage, how you communicate, how you find a way into that player to make sure that you can, you know, he's open to listening to you. And then probably the, the, the other one I'd say would be a, a Peter Vivian, who is a little out there in terms of the way he works. But what he does do is he makes you, you think around why you do certain things, which, again, I think how we work with the players here and as a staff, how I want us to work is... For players to understand why they're doing things and not just because they're being told. So, uh, I, yeah, I'm very fortunate. I think I've kind of got four or five varied mentors that have kind of given me different sort of uh, skill sets. 
Let's go back to the brilliant start to the season. You were awarded the League One Manager of the Month for August as well. How pleasing was that to get the recognition for the start that you've had? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've been asked a few times about it, and I never want to sound disrespectful or you know talk it down because look, it's a fantastic achievement when I look at it. But again, it is about the staff, it is about the players. It's, a, it's probably more of a club award than anything. I think you know. Um, I can only be as good as you know the the people I've got around me and the players that we've got here. So um, I, I do very much see it as a collective. It is obviously recognition. We had a good start in, I have to say, a really difficult opening four or five games that we had. It was you know when you look, it was some really challenging fixtures that you know fortunately the, the lads have you know got their head down, worked, and really bought into what we're doing. And um, yeah, it's obviously nice to get the results and you know the award with it. And perhaps a tricky one this weekend as well, Extra City. They've started really well as well under Gary Caldwell. What do you expect to see from them on Saturday? A tough game. They've obviously started extremely well. I think they've had an extremely busy summer as well with their transfer business. But I, I think they're a side, you know, in terms of when you look at their kind of their histories, their traditions, their, their ways of playing. I think they're, they're, they'll bring different problems to what we've maybe faced so far. So um, it's one I'm really looking forward to. And yeah, we'll, uh, we'll obviously do all the work that we can to make sure we're aware of them. But Ultimately, the emphasis then shifts back on us. Yeah, and it's in partnership with the Her Game 2 campaign. We're all seeing the growth of the women's game. From your perspective, from someone that is working within the game, how do you see the game growing and developing? Yeah, yeah. again, obviously, fan as well, I think, in terms of obviously the, the biggest thing. I think that's where if you look at how the, probably the world's evolved in terms of you know, the, the number of and accessibility of games on TV, social media, you know, that, the coverage from that aspect, I think is... It's been terrific to uh, you know to see how it's evolved, how it's grown, and and obviously now the opportunity now for for people to to have a passion but be able to pursue it, which I think is obviously massively important as well. So I think yeah, it's it's, it's something that you know long may it continue, and I think there's obviously still big steps to make in, in that area. And um, yeah, I know us as a football club, we're we're trying to make sure that we're you know kind of proactive with it and on the front foot as well. Yeah, and obviously the success of the Lionesses has been fantastic in terms of the growth of the women's game. How important do you think that has been, not only in growing the game, but just shining a spotlight on the level that this game is played at? Yeah, no, terrific to be fair. I watched, watched the, the, all of it, to be fair, in terms of the tournament. So I think it's, it's one of those, I think, you know, that, like I said, the accessibility now for... For young girls growing up and having role models and people and you know that they can aspire to and I'm big here as well you know for, the, for for anybody to have dreams and be able to you know to have that pathway and pursue it and know it's a viable option as a as a career and a profession I think is huge so again it's like, keep coming back to it because I do think there are genuinely you know areas where it still has to improve and still has to get better but again I think the fact that you know there are role models and obviously we've had so much success um, you know, internationally, it can only be a positive thing in terms of what it does for you know for, for people in the playground where that passion probably starts. Yeah. What about Oxford United itself then as well? How important to develop the women's team here? Yeah, and it's, a, it's a big part of obviously what we're trying to do. I think in terms of as a, as a club, I know our, so our director of performance, Harry, works across as well. So he we, we try and liaise programs in terms of what we can transfer across and how that looks. So we we try to work closely in certain areas. Gemma, um, who runs it, does a terrific job in terms of uh, overseeing it. And it's areas where, again, I, I look at myself as well, and we still have to improve. I still have to work closer. But again, I think in terms of, you know, when you look at, you know, the potential of the new stadium down the line, and obviously, you know, give, giving the ladies a home, the same as us, I think is a, you know, a really important part of what we're trying to do. And, and again, I think uh, for, for me, it's that constantly looking at how do, how do we operate? How do we make it better? How do we, you know, bring things closer together? Yeah. Liam, great to speak to you. All the best for the rest of the campaign. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.